can you hear me now? That was a famous low slogan by a, a cell phone carrier uh, a decade ago. Um, but when we read this next chapter that we are about to go, hearing is extremely important. Because hearing is also associated with obedience. So let me show you a little bit what I'm talking about. Good morning, morning, Your Honor. Good morning, Linda. This is my wonderful husband. I got the ticket. He was driving my car. I'm not guilty. He is. Let me, exp- let me explain what happened. I, can't I get wait. the ticket in the mail, and I go, what's this? He says, just pay it. I said, what happened? He says, I'm at the corner of Eddie and Dudley, and I turned right on a yellow light. I, sa- I said, you went through a yellow light? He says, yeah. I said, I'm not paying it. We're going to fight this. Our son was in the hospital, had a very bad car accident, and he was going there three times. It just is. She starts, she starts describing what had happened, and eventually the judge points, may, points out the, the fact that um, he ran the... There's a certain level of tolerance of 0.2 seconds that an individual can cross from yellow to red that is unticketable. And he crossed it at 0.3. And so they start going back and forth, and then it, 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 for some reason, she, she, as he begins to... In, explain to her the process is she begins to interrupt him and 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 he said um how long you've been married and she says 43 years which he the judge goes so this has been happening for 43 years (laughs) and she perks up and 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 says We've been happily married for 43, right, 43 years, right? <laughs> yes, dear. <laughs> you have to see it. You can look at this. Is, you can't make this stuff up. And, and, and uh, Judge uh, Caprio is a real judge. This isn't TV court. This isn't made up stuff. This is real thing. And it's in Rhode Island of all places. But he, was, he, he went viral because of a particular video which he demonstrated mercy. You can look him up, not now. You can Google him, you can Facebook him, not now. And you'll, you, you will eventually see if you find, um, put his name in there and put the couple, or put couple with ticket in They'll pop up, and you'll see it. It's quite entertaining. Um, But the fact that she says, right, honey? Just leave it. (laughs) I'll show you afterwards, Sam, if you want to. Um, The fact that she looks at him and says, right, honey? Without skipping a beat, he says, yes, dear. You know, we look at that, and and believe me, I'm not going to get into the component of, and your desire shall be for the husband. That is not where I'm getting it going today. But I want you to focus on the, the idea and the concept of hearing. Because when we end chapter two, Verse 
verse 25 says, and they were both naked, the man and the, his wife, and they were not ashamed. Okay. And then we read chapter 3. It says, now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? What is interesting is that when the serpent is going to talk to Eve, actually Eve wasn't even named yet. The small little details in this chapter is that she was known as the woman. It wasn't until after the fall that she was given her name. And I'll come to that. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the, of the fruit of the trees and of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it lest you die. Did God say that? No. God said, do not eat, you will die. She added, do not touch it. Please, do not think I am focusing on the woman. That's not the point. She was a vessel. That's a fact. What is interesting at this point, as they are dialoguing with one with another, there, there is an emphasis on prohibition rather than an emphasis on provision. God told specifically to Adam that you are to tend and keep. We saw this already, right? His responsibility to keep was to guard. At this point, I also believe, the Bible doesn't say it, but there's the, it's inferred that they had to communicate at some point. Both Adam and Eve had to have spoken at some point and discussed what was happening in the garden. Or that God said, hey, don't, don't go near there. The fact that she acknowledges that she could not eat from that tree tells me is that there was a conversation somewhere at some point that somebody i believe adam and god told them both specifically do not eat you have all the other trees and all the other herbs and all the other vegetation and you can eat everything but this one and so satan takes that prohibition And emphasize, oh, whoa, isn't God good? He said you couldn't eat any of the tree? Hmm. For some, this is the the cup half full. While others, it's half empty. See, if you look at this and think, you know, why should I, why, why did God limit that one tree? I would counter by what's one tree compared to the rest of the earth. Let that sink in for a little bit. And so the emphasis was to take away from God's provision, God's goodness. As a matter of fact, we believe that that is essentially the reason why Satan was expelled. Because he wanted what he wanted rather than what God had provided. We understand that Satan, Lucifer, before the fall, he was the top angel in authority in heaven. The one who took his place was Gabriel, the one who announced to Mary that she was going to be with child the same one who announced to her cousin, Elizabeth, she was going to be with child. 
God had blessed and provided, but he wanted the one thing he couldn't have. And so now the things that we, as, as Adam and Eve are engaged, and Eve more specifically is engaged in this dialogue, she takes, she sees that the tree is good and beautiful to eat. I've, of, I've often referred to it as a beautiful mango tree. Oh my goodness, give me a nice set of juicy mango that you can, mm, no. I don't know what tree it was. It's been portrayed as an apple tree. Really? An apple? Nothing wrong with it. And if you like apples, I do too. Especially in pies. Mary? (laughs) But the Bible tells that, let me read it for you. So the woman, this is not being derogatory. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm being very clear on this. Saw that the tree was good, verse 6, was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes in the tree, desirable to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband. Now, what is interesting at this point It doesn't call Adam by name. It calls the man as her husband. There is so much, there's so much in here. I, 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 have, I have to focus on exactly where I want to go. I told you I could spend four, um, an entire month, four Sabbaths on just this chapter alone. And he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were what? They were naked. And I know kids, some of you will be looking at me like, Professor Art, why are you talking about that stuff? That's how you and I came out into this world. That is how God created us. The Bible says so. But here's the key difference. In verse 25 in chapter 2, it says, They were both naked, the man and the woman. They were not ashamed. That has nothing to do with intimacy. But then when you look at this verse, Genesis 3, 7, They were both naked, and they sewed sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Why? What changed? They were ashamed. They were humiliated. The word naked in the Bible, in its context, in the Old Testament and New Testament, whenever that comes up, it's a derogatory word that implies that the individual has been humiliated and its protective garment is no longer a part of their body. The shroud that involved Adam and Eve before the sin was gone. But this is, the, this is not the only time the word naked appears in this chapter. Okay? Nakedness in the, in the Bible equals separation from God. You look at Revelation. Talking about the Laodicean church. You're rich, or you think you're rich, but you're poor. You're nothing but poor, blind, and naked. This is what it's saying. You have distanced yourself. You're not, you're not even cold. You're just, you don't care anymore. And so, they find themselves trying to protect themselves from their shame. You know, there's, it's one thing for you to be humbled, and it's another thing to be humiliated. They're not the same. They were humiliated. 
they were not humbled. They were ashamed. Verse 8, And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. I can't help it but laugh. Right? Then the Lord, verse 9, Then the Lord called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? You know, I just said that almost as if you've done something. Did you catch that? I don't think that that's what happened at all. I believe Jesus was walking in the garden and said, Hey, Adam, where are you? I can't find you. Looking for him because that was customary. They were used to having a relationship, to, to have a, a, a face-to-face encounter prior to this moment. It was normal for humanity to be in the presence of divinity. But the Bible says, I heard, and what happened? He hid. He fled. He didn't obey. Verse 10, so he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. What? Who told you you were naked? You see the difference? You see... God created Adam and Eve naked in the beginning but shrouded them with his protection. And as long as they had obeyed the commandment, do not eat of that tree, they had that shroud of protection. As long as they focused on the provision rather than the prohibition, they were safe. How many times have you and I, I put myself in this mix, have looked and focused on the prohibition, and when we did that, we got ourselves into trouble. (laughs) Right? Hey, Art, don't eat this. This is for Sabbath. (laughs) Yeah, some of you are laughing. Yeah, you, you did the same thing, huh? Right? Hey, don't do dot, dot, dot. But as long as we stayed within the provision, we were safe. And so, comes the question. Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not, which you should not eat? It's not like, have you eaten the tree that I told you not to eat? I don't believe he he did that at all. It was, hey, we're talking. And you know, as hard as it is, as humans as we are, it's easy to fly off the handle when we know we're right. But not God. Then the man, again, said, the woman who you gave to me, this is your fault. She gave me of the tree and I ate. And the Lord said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. That's the very first time that we see in earth's history of passing the buck. The woman you gave me, this is your fault, God. Oh, okay. What happened? Oh, the serpent you created. You put it in the garden. It deceived me. Hmm. You know, the problem, again, that Eve had was that she believed in the serpent. 
more than when she believed in God. We often believe in the lie or the liar more than we have in the one who has given us the truth. (laughs) You can't handle the truth. You want me on that wall. You need me on that wall. Well, let me digress. but those words could, will be applied to Jesus. Because the very next words that came out of his mouth were, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. There's an interesting concept going on here because seed is used commonly to figure for descendants it's not talking about the serpents you know little snakes that come out afterwards it's actually talking about those who would side with those who would believe in him and the seed of the woman would then let me pause here for a minute this is God's grace at its finest Rather than saying, look what you've done, you're going to die. Because the very first blessing that God gave to Adam and Eve was be fruitful and? And what happened? They sinned. Rather than taking the blessing that he gave in, in, in the beginning, he just said, your pain will increase. He still has given you women the blessing of giving life. And in every aspect that he goes on, and when he talks to Adam later on, he also says, and for Adam and his wife, the Lord made tunics of skin. And all that, I got ahead of myself. Let me go back. Go back one slide, please. He said, you're going to toil the ground. You're off the sweat of your brow. You are going to earn your keep. You're going to eat off the land. You're going to do all these things. It's going to be arduous. It's going to be laborious. It's going it's to be difficult. God's purpose for humanity never changed. Because he said, your job here is to tend to the garden and to keep it. I'm going to take you away from the garden but you will still tend to the soil. The curses that God gave were to remind us of what we had lost. Not to say, look what you did, and as a result of what you've done, out you go. And this is where my mind is blown. God says, also, for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. You see, it's not until the end of this chapter that you see Adam naming his wife Eve. You know what Eve stands for? The mother of all. It was after this blessing that God said, listen, he, Adam and Eve both heard that there was going to be a fight somewhere between the two descendants. And they heard it and they understood it. And now they're applying it to their own lives. We have lost what we had gained at the beginning because we focused on the prohibition instead of the provision. But God has still blessed us with an opportunity to have someone come to rescue us. With that sentence, Brueggemann, a theologian, writes, With the sentence given, God does for the couple what they cannot do for themselves. They cannot deal with their shame, but God can, will, and does. 
See, they tried sewing clothes made out of leaves. What kind of protection would that give? People are wearing leather to this day, despite all the technological advances we have. Quote, unquote. But God in his mercy, he illustrates what would cost him. Adam and Eve did not know. Adam and Eve did not understand what that cost would be. Adam and Eve could only see what they had lost. But they knew that somebody was going to come in the future. This is where we see Revelation 13, 8 come into fruition. Next slide, please. You know what Revelation 13, 8 says? Open your Bibles. Because this is what it says. Go back one, please. It says, All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose name has not been written in the book, whose name has not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. In other words, Jesus knew and the plan was already in place should have Adam and Eve have fallen. It was already established. John understood this. It wasn't just John that understood this. Peter did too. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, but with the precious blood of Christ, he indeed was foreordained. The foreordained here is not predestination as if it was set in stone, but it was chosen before the foundation of the world. But not only Peter, Paul, and I love this verse, Ephesians 1, chapter 4, says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, of, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. You see, God has chosen you and I and Adam and Eve to be redeemed, to be in a relationship. Knowing that you were born into a sinful world, we did not have the privilege of knowing and choosing whether or not to obey, but we do have a choice. We do have a choice to choose whom we will hear. Whom we will obey. Why? Simple. Because for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. How do we know this? Because of family. Paul illustrates this very fact by using the family metaphor when it comes to adoption. Paul says that we have been adopted into Christ. Now, it, what is really interesting about this metaphor is that when Paul talks about adoption, he's using it from a Roman citizen's perspective. Everybody wanted to be a Roman citizen because it gave you particular rights. And if you were born outside of that citizenship and you were adopted by a Roman citizen or a family that, were, that had or possessed or were Roman citizens, you gained all all the privileges of that family and of that citizenship without having been born into it. And so he uses this to say that you and I have been adopted into God's family. 